pants, pants are more comfortable for me. I wear pants every day. I mean, I'm wearing pants right now. I think that pants should definitely be an option. I think it would be wrong if people were judgmental about people wearing pants. Only they're a form of self-expression. If they weren't an option, I would be very upset because then I wouldn't know what to wear. I wouldn't be able to wear sweatpants. I wouldn't be able to stay warm. Yet, I would not like that. Woman in pants, something that seems so ordinary today, couldn't have happened without Amelia Bloomer. She advocated for the first woman's pants, known as bloomers, but she couldn't popularize them by herself. Bloomers finally caught on during the 1870s bicycle craze because of the need for mobility to cycle. The ensuing velocipede mania pushed out the outdated heavy skirts in favor of the newfangled bloomer pants. In the 19th century, the woman's fashion of long skirts and tight bodices faced scorn almost as heavy as the garment. An article published in 1887 described this in vivid detail. Every time a woman takes a step, her foot contends with her skirt. The weight may be ounces or pounds, but it is taken up at every step. The heavy skirts with flounces over skirts, bustle, braids, beads, and other trimmings hang their many pounds and many yards, flapping around the legs and the feet of the wearer. The corset does not allow space to take a full breath, and the tight sleeves cause the muscles to cry for room. The dresses were also mocked for slowing the woman's suffrage movement, as shown by the comic, A Woman's Suffrage Squelcher. How can she vote when the fashions are so wide and the voting booths are so narrow? In 1851, a Seneca County Courier editor suggested women switch to Turkish pantaloons for comfort, despite previously opposing women's rights. Feminist Amelia Bloomer, editor of trailblazing women's magazine The Lily, praised the clothing idea but criticized his stance on women's rights. At almost exactly the same time, Bloomer's neighbor, suffragist Elizabeth Cady Stanton, mm -hmm. received a visit from her cousin, Elizabeth Smith Miller, who was wearing the very outfit Bloomer had just been discussing in the press. Alternatively called Turkish trousers or pantaloons, the outfit combined knee-length skirts with loose pants. Stanton and Bloomer raved about the look, and Bloomer published an article about it in the April 51 edition of The Lily. Bloomer later wrote, as soon as it became known that I was wearing the new dress, letters came pouring in upon me by hundreds from women all over the country making inquiries about the dress and asking for patterns, showing how ready and anxious women were to throw off the burden of long, heavy skirts. The Lily's sales skyrocketed, jumping from 500 per month to 4,000. Middle-class women across the country enthusiastically embraced the new style, holding bloomer conventions and flaunting them in public. Like a captive, set free from his ball and chain, I was always ready for a brisk walk through sleet and snow and rain, to climb a mountain, jump over a fence, work in the garden, and was fit for any necessary locomotion," wrote Stanton. What a sense of liberty I felt, with no skirts to hold or brush ready at any moment, to climb a hilltop to see the sun go down or the moon rise, with no ruffles or trails impeded by the dew or soiled by the grass," she continued. Even though Amelia Bloomer protested that the pants weren't her invention, they became known as bloomers with people who wore them called bloomerites, or practicing bloomerism. Several established suffragists adopted the look, such as Susan B. Anthony, Lucy Stone, and Paulina Wright Davis. But not everyone raved about bloomers. The opposition mostly came from men, who feared that the act of women adopting the masculine style would lead to them adopting other masculine attributes, such as independence. There are many pieces of work describing this fear, such as the bloomer costume, as sung by Lewis Knight. This song portrays the replacement of men with women, as shown by the verse. When we see women dabbling in what our regular trade is, I suppose the men must stay at home abandoning little babies. Some women also opposed bloomerism. This view persevered into the 1930s, illustrated by one article published by Movie Classic 4. Trousers for women are incredible, ridiculous and absurd. I can't imagine wearing such atrocities. Such a style will never please American men. Women who wore bloomers were publicly ridiculed and disdained. One group of young women were banned from attending church due to their choices in fashion. This led to many suffragists abandoning the look, as their clothes were drawing more attention than their cause. Bloomers went dormant for years, but then the bicycle brouhaha of the 1860s began. The 1860s and 70s were in the heart of the Reconstruction after the American Civil War. Women's roles were shifting and new roads were built. Recreational activities were also popularized, such as riding the penny farthing. 
However, the high seat to keep riders off of the dusty paths led to a dangerous ride. Few men decided to ride the uncomfortable penny farthing, let alone women. But with the new roads in new cities, dust was no longer an issue, and the bicycle was reinvented as the Velocipede. Which is not a dinosaur, despite the name. The Velocipede was a bike that looked a bit more like the ones we see today. Its proximity with the ground made it a lot more safe to ride, hence the alternative name of the safety bicycle. This smooth ride attracted many more people, including women. Women defended their choice to cycle to the general public, arguing that biking broke them out of their monotonous lives, therefore prolonging them and allowing women to support their families for longer. Men approved of female cycling, as shown by a poem reading, Up and away doth a woman ride, her pace with men folk holding, husband or lover side by side, rare womanly charms enfolding. When on her wheel she mounts to flee, so gracefully and sweetly, finds life worth living well when she puts her best foot forward neatly. Some articles worried over the health risks of women biking, such as the development of an exophthalmic goiter, appendicitis, and internal inflammation. But health concerns couldn't stop the advances in women's suffrage created by cycling. Bicycles brought women out of their private home series and into the public eye. Women became more involved in public activities, gaining independence. However, long skirts didn't work for velocipedes, catching in the wheels and dragging in the mud. At first, Bicycle manufacturers attempted to solve this problem, creating push bikes and box bikes. However, these inventions weren't nearly as efficient or had the same appeal to women as the safety bicycles. The dresses had to change. Many modifications were created, such as divided skirts, skirts that shortened with drawstrings, skirt securing devices that kept the fabric close to the ankle, and a bicycle corset. Some women adopted these looks, but none were as popular as bloomers. Bloomers outshone all other modifications, and once again, became the biggest fashion trend of the late 1800s. However, this time, bloomers had a socially acceptable reason to wear them beyond women's suffrage. Cycling was the perfect excuse to bring back bloomers, and the women's pants were now here to stay. Elizabeth Cady Stanton wrote, To sum up, I would say, let women ride. If some prefer the skirts flying in the wind, exhausted in the wheels, let them run the risk of their folly. If others prefer bloomers, let them enjoy their choice. If others prefer knickerbockers, leave them in peace. Bicycle instruction books recommended bloomers, insisting upon the comfort and ease provided. One of the many immediate effects of this breakthrough in bloomerism was independence of women. Women no longer had to be carted around by their spouses, but now had a mode of self-transportation. Bloomers allowed them to move around easily. A colossal example in a Londonderry who bicycled around the world wearing bloomers in the 1890s. The bloomers were accepted as a cycling outfit, but not yet as an addition to one's everyday wardrobe as they are today. A half a century later, women were still fighting to wear pants, and Hollywood star Katherine Hepburn led the way. In the 1930s, she starred in many notable movies, such as Little Woman, Morning Glory, and ba Bringing Up Baby but one of her most notable choices were her pants. Hepburn didn't just wear pants, she also set the meaning behind pants, a confident, independent woman. While working on a movie, Hepburn's jeans were confiscated. Instead of abandoning the pants, Hepburn arrived on set in her knickers and wouldn't cover up with anything other than her jeans. On pants 50 years ago and declared a sort of middle road. You know, but I mean, I have not lived as a woman. I have lived as a man, oh. and in a few, well, I've just done what I damn well wanted to, and I made enough money to support myself, and I ain't afraid of being alone. Throughout the rest of her life, the Hollywood star continued to wear pants, pioneering the style for young women. In summary, the 19th century introduction of bloomers gained initial attention, then faded, but later found acceptance as bicycling attire. And maybe in the next 50 years, men will take over the dress scene as they discover the delight of an airy skirt on a hot and humid day. In all, the American bicycle craze in the 1860s and 70s was a turning point for bloomerism, which led to woman in pants and dress reform. Claire's with her hands lifted up in a maze That I'm coming out as a bloomer That I'm coming out as